he's a busy man. And so while I've managed to get his attention, I want him to talk about um, his years in the safari business and then wildlife related activities because Paul goes back a long way in the, in, in the post Rhodesia era. And it was, it was in the early 80s that you, that you decided to try and get canoeing going. And you know, Paul, I can actually remember seeing you, I think I was with Trevor in Madaviland at the time, and I saw you at, at, a, at a drinks or something and you said, you're going to go raft, uh, canoeing on the Zambezi. I said, geez, you must need your bloody head red. You're going to get, you're going to get killed on that river. Well, you went ahead and, and, and did it. So just, just tell us about how you got involved. So, I, absolutely 100% for the record, I did not start the business that I, that then became a success. It was a, a good friend of mine, Eddie Rouse. He came up with the idea of commercial canoe safaris on the Zambezi. And it's very important that, that, that this is clear. Um, as kids, Hunters, uh, because my father was a DC, we spent a time on the Zambezi when, when he was based at Wakey. We spent a lot of time on the Zambezi. And I'd always liked the idea, even at university, of somehow making a living doing something on the Zambezi. But they were inchoate, vague thoughts. <laughs> whereas whereas um, Ed came up with the actual business I, plan. With the business plan. Mm -hmm. And then because Ed and I knew each other, he asked me, and he knew I loved the Zambezi, he, he asked me to get involved. I was a, a partner actually in a, in a very good law firm at the time and uh, just got married to a woman of extraordinary beauty who was my wife and um, and um, I, I went back to her one day and said should, should I just bin the partnership and should we just go out and live and be feral and just just live a life of romance and excitement and adventure with no plan, no itinerary, no idea. What made that happen, Hannes? How did we think that way? I don't believe it was a specifically individual thing. I think, ironically, a guerrilla war gave us a freedom. Yes, it's, we, were the, we were the losers, but we, had, we just got this immense sense of freedom mm -hmm. afterwards. Mm -hmm. And because there hadn't been that much sort of adherence to rules and regulations, <laughs> during the last few years of the war, we didn't bother about rules. There, there, you will know that there were so few rules. When we started, when Eddie started canoeing, and then when I got into rafting and kayaking on the Zambezi above Victoria Falls, there were no rules. It was five years before National Parks asked me to go um, to see them in Harare to establish the rules. That's the freedom we all had. Yes, yes. We were, it was the most, we, we were, we were the cutting edge of freedom mm -hmm. and of adventure in this new brand of tourism, without really knowing why. And of course, the big thing we had is this, mm -hmm. just this, this, this overwhelming confidence. And I, I yes. always think confidence is often, mm -hmm. <laughs> it sometimes just shouldn't be there because it really the best form of confidence mm -hmm. derives from being a bit ignorant. We had no plan. We didn't know what we were doing. When we started canoeing, whitewater rafting, kayaking, we didn't know what we were doing. We became good, but we never questioned our ability because there was no areas of comparison. Mm -hmm. If now somebody said, oh, do you, you want to do this or want to do that? Mm -hmm. There would be too much of a track record. There would have been too many hippo hits, too many crocodile hits, too many accidents yeah. on the Zambezi. The parameters would have been there. There were none. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's a, it, what is that gigantic archangel of human thought and the human mind? It's beyond interpretation. It's beyond pinning down to within parameters and say, this will work out. Ah, now that happened. So we, so by the time Marie and I had, uh, we, we just got married and then I boosted the size of the canoeing operation on the lower Zambezi River, safaris between three days and nine days. And that became a huge success. And then, I'd always loved the falls. Um, we'd had um, we'd had uh, one daughter and Claire, uh, the second about to come, 
And I said to me, let's just go, let's just go feral. Let's just, this life is about, for us, it's about romance and excitement and adventure. And we'll find it. And we had it. And we had it without danger. We had it without risk. We were a bit, of course, there was a bit of a risk. You know, when you, when you, I mean, those first two weeks of learning how to raft on what is the biggest one-day whitewater run in the world, the only way to do it was to bring up 12 mates and be guinea pigs. Because I didn't mind if they broke arms or legs. <laughs> they were mates, it doesn't matter. They weren't going to sue me. So they all volunteered. So for two weeks, day after day, we just ran it and ran it and ran it. And then we went commercial. And we were not good. But we became good quickly because you have to come back. You know the element. You're a professional hunter. You know what's involved in if things go wrong. But we were aware of that without the, tra the trappings of, 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 of too much knowledge, you know. That, that too much knowledge is a bad thing. It, it, it involves too much analysis. We didn't analyze, we just lived. Somebody mm -hmm. contacted me recently um, from who's trying to put together a National Geographic movie and said to me, what particular event stands out to you? And I said to him, nothing, because that entire period was such a wonderful event. Mm -hmm. and in the entire period, you know, you, you you went to bed at night almost reluctantly thinking, I'm wasting time, there's too much to do. There's, hey, we were all youngsters then, but there was still, we, we just felt, I need more time to do all these things. We just, we just lived, Hannes, we just, we, we, we mm -hmm. lived, we were, we lived lean and loose limbed. Yeah. And we wanted for nothing. We had very little. I remember my beautiful wife having to sell some of her clothes. We, 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 um, we, <laughs> you know, it was feral, man. It was wonderful. Um, and yeah. it worked. You know, Paul, I think you did right. I don't want to sort of over dramatize the whole thing, but that, that, that military experience, I think we were all, it all came at us so quickly at such a young age, and we were th we were thrown in the deep end. I mean, when I say tell modern day soldiers that it was most of us were deployed in four eight man sticks sections with a map and a compass and your weapons, and told see you in two weeks. You know that doesn't happen in many modern armies. So what I'm what I'm saying is, we were actually um, we were dropped in the deep end very early in life. Mm -hmm. So. After that, you know, things didn't look too daunting. No, um, quite right. Yeah, whatever it was. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why our generation have done, have done pretty impressive stuff mm. because challenges don't, don't trouble them too much. Yep. And uh, I yep. think that's that pretty much what happened with you. But Paul, I want to deviate a little bit because I know you, you still were competitive as an athlete, but now you, you were on the river you turned your attention to rowing and then you started to take it quite seriously. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, it, it's a, it's a, I, I got into single sculling. Well, there was nobody else ready to row with. So I bought a second, a, 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 yeah, a, a, a single, locally made um, single skull and just started working on the Zambezi because I was fit, Hannes. I, I, I ran like every day. Um, I was rafting, I was rowing a raft, I was kayaking, so that keeps the right muscles in, in shape for, for, for rowing. And running keeps the, the, um, uh, the uh, cardiovascular situation in good shape. And then, and I was lightweight, I'm always, I've always been a lightweight division. For a lightweight I was tall, and so I realized I could row quite well, but my training ground was the Zambezi. And a single skull is like being on a tightrope. It is like being on a tightrope. You can turn over with anything, if anything goes wrong. If one blade hits the water too early, the, too much before the other blade, that boat can go over. Uh, it's so precarious, that thing. So there's crocodiles and hippos on this river, as you well know. So my training ground was a flat sort of four kilometer stretch. And I had to train with a 44 Magnum, uh, which I would wedge between my feet. You, you can't put it here because the rowing stroke takes your hands yeah. right up here. And even that weight of a 44 Magnum unbalances you. So I'd wedge it between my feet, um, obviously fully loaded, just in case I needed to, to defend myself from crocs, which I did need to on three occasions. Um, Tell us what happened with the crocs. So, so, yeah. So when you're turning, 
a single skull around um, takes a long time because mm. it's close to eight meters and it's this wide and um, you can tip. And when it's going that slowly, on two occasions, crops came off the bank and were coming towards me with, with intent. intent. You could see it was intent. <laughs> you could see it was intent. I think very often, as you will know, a crocodile will come towards you, but you, some, there's some look about it or there's some movement about it. You know, it's just idle threat and it'll go down and as, as many. And I thought, this guy's just chancing his arm. It's not going to be serious, but you kind of sense when that head is skimming across uh, at speed, this, something's going to happen. And then I pulled, I would pull the weapon out. Um, uh, and I don't care. You know, I don't care what the, what the environmentalists say. There's thousands of crocodiles here. If I could have killed two, three to save my life, so be it. Um, uh, and once I hit one, but of course in a skull, you're going backwards. And I, my, I reach for to put the blades and to take the stroke and one blade was walloped by a croc. And of course, you know, you have to relax. You've got to put in the power and relax. And the blade came out of my hand and I panicked and managed to keep the boat upright. But that croc disappeared. They, you know, normally they're not after you. So I got good, Hannes. I, I realized that, so I bought an ergo machine, um, an ergometer, Concept 2. And the, the, the Concept 2 people would send out a magazine three, four times a year with all the, the international uh, rankings, readings of, of how you were covering, of your times mm -hmm. over in those days, strange enough, two and a half, you know, the standard race at Olympic or any international level is, is, is two kilometers. These would, they test you over two and a half kilometers. I would compare my times with, with them. And I thought, hey, I can make the Olympics. I can, I can get to the top. And I did. So, How old were you now? so now I started mm -hmm. at the age of 38, I suppose, when I first started rowing. And then it was now about, I was about 42. Um, but, um, so you had to be in the top percentile of the of the most impressive age group. Strange enough, in rowing, like um, Redgrave and others, they've been in their late 30s. At the time when I when I qualified for the Olympics, and I did qualify for the Olympics, the the um, the world there were two leaders in the world. The one Brit guy called um, Haynes. He he I think was 37, 38, and there was an Australian who was a bit younger. But they were the world champs. At 38, uh, Olympic winners, world championship winners. Um, so at 42, with my, the background I'd had in running and rowing and kayaking, I thought, well, I'm not daunted by four years. So I did reach the top, the top part of the top percentile, and then I knew I could, uh, I could make it. So I did qualify, um, but I was. And the, and the team was going. A Zimbabwe team was going. Obviously not. Which Olympics? Row. This was Which the Atlanta Olympics. Olympics. Oh. Um, 96. So I, and I got a, an official um, letter, which I still have from the International Olympic Committee saying that if this guy qualifies, you will please include him in your Olympic team. Because rowing is quite late in the qualifying agenda of Olympics. Um, and I don't even remember, I don't think they, they didn't deign to respond to say, yeah, sure, we'll agree. Zimbabwe um, the Zimbabwe Committee. Olympic yeah. Committee. Um, and when I did qualify, I was then given the news, you're not, you're not going. Um, and um, two, um, Ian Hunter, Suzanne Standish-White, who were like my sort of mentors, they, took, they obviously took offense and said, why? Why is he not going? Oh, he's too old. And they said, he's qualified. His, his ergo time's off the top end. He's qualified. Um, uh, okay, well, we're not sending him because it's an elitist sport. So, of course, it is an elitist sport because not many people, it's not like football or, or athletics or anything, because not many people have the opportunity to, to row. So, naturally, I accept that. The fact is, on international times, I got there, you know, whether it's elitist sport or not. Um, and... Uh, it's a bloody hard sport. Very unfair. After so, all the... Yeah, you put, 
I, uh, four it. years non-stop, I, I employed somebody to run my safari companies for me and just rode and rode and rode. And you know, Marie had to put up with it. Eh? You know, M M Marie had to, she'd come out early in the morning with a cup of coffee and I'd just, I'd just be killing me to the sun coming up over the Zambezi, the, the mist, and I'd just row. I frequently would encounter elephant just swimming across the river. Um, that was frequent. Um, mm -hmm. Twice in all those years did I come across lion on the banks, um, but only twice. Um, uh, I'd see herds of buffalo. Mm. They were they were dramatic years, man. Yeah. Oh, that's an unusual, just another unusual story from a, a guy that's led a very unusual life by any other by most standards. But you also the only guy I know who's actually been attacked by a leopard in his kitchen. <laughs> yes, Hannes, and I've told that story so many times, <laughs> I'm not to, going to tell that story. Tell I've, written, I've, I've written a, a three-page article. Just quickly. quickly. You were in the kitchen. What's so, 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 no, there, 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 was, there, was a, there was a strange sort of wonderful contradiction, irony about this. I think you know that over the years I'd go off on expeditions on rivers and I'd Normally solo, I'd go, to, so I did three tributaries of the Congo, for example, and I'd just come back from a, been away for close on five weeks on a solo trip down one of the tributaries of the, of the Congo, and where anything can go wrong, and if something goes wrong there, that's it, yeah. it's all over. But of course, nothing did go wrong. I think much of it is, 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 is in the mind, but hey, it's not easy. So now I'm back in my, in my house, in the safety of my house, and a leopard was, and feeling really good, feeling really comfortable. I've got a nice chair to sit in, I've got meals to eat, and I'm in my comfort zone. And a leopard had been in town eating dogs and cats. And, um, and uh, so it was around, people knew it was around. My next door neighbor came in to um, have a cup of coffee with me. She was sitting in my up in my office. We were having coffee in the garden. I came sprinting past, sprinting past. Like, oh, there's a leopard. The leopard's trying to get in the house. The leopard's trying to get in the house. Now you know, you're a hunter. Leopards are not normally dangerous to a full-grown person. You can chase a leopard away by just going shoot, clapping your hands. It'll run away normally. So I said to my neighbour, just go inside with your child, and um, and I'll chase a leopard away. Then we can have our continue with our cup of coffee so I go out of the kitchen door and sure enough the leopard's trying to get in it's after our dog so it's trying but it's too big it can't get in the window so I see it it's probably five meters from me and it's trying and I go out and I clap and I go 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 I don't even, I don't even swear at that thing I just say go go well it turned you, know, you, you would know the the look in that eye when it and you think, ooh, I've made a big mistake. In three bounds, it had me. I put that, it just came. That, that, that in the kitchen. Dante esque growl from its mm. yard. No, 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 not in the kitchen, just outside the kitchen. Mm. Three uh, bounds, it had me. And I put my arm up to protect my face, hit me in the arm. Boom, and we went down on the painting outside the kitchen. Round one. Lots of yelling and shouting and and punching and I was, it had written this left hand and a forearm in its mouth and I was punching it as hard as I could on the on the nose which I wasn't enjoying because every time I punched I noticed it would blink like this <laughs> so but I wasn't doing any significant damage it still had this arm now I see blood beginning to come out onto the pavement I said, oh, no, I've got to get away from it rip the arm and hand out try and strangle it which is which is futile to try and strike. Also knowing I've got to keep away from its back claws mm -hmm. because I don't want to be eviscerated by this. So I tried, realized that was not going to work, shouting whenever I get a breath of, of air to, to my neighbor and the, get, get the child to safety, get the child to say, you know, immediately my thought goes to the children because I had four of my own and um, get the child to safety. I leave the leopard, almost make the kitchen door. It's up, boom, hits me again. But this time I don't go down, I, it, 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 it's my other hand and wrist. I just go down on a knee and fight like hell to, to, to get clear of it. And I just wrench this arm now out of, its, out of its mouth and slam the door. Now, I'm running across my kitchen to 
because my kitchen has two sets of doors. One's the other side there. And, and this leopard has run around the side and above my kitchen sink, there's a huge pane of glass with window on either side, just above the kitchen sink. I stop and look out that window pane and the leopard has come around and it's looking at me from outside. And I think I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen. And it launches straight up, leading with the left. I remember I was leading with the left, smashes the pane to splinters and sp just splinters of, of, of glass everywhere. And I just thought, I've, got to, I've just got to belt this thing. And I, I was ready on this occasion. So I hit it as hard as I could. I'm not a big guy, but it was a decent punch. And it was decent enough to drop it onto the kitchen sink. It's on the sink. Its rump is on these shards of glass which helped me because I think that must have hurt it and it must have, what's going on here? But it was, it, now I'm worried because it had three occasions to, to go away from me, three, and it hasn't. I thought it definitely wants to kill me now. And so I'm now, but I'm getting a bit dizzy. You talk about the Olympics, it was very soon after I'd qualified for that, so I was fit. I could, I could keep going for a while. Um, you know, your average race is sort of, six to seven minutes in, 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 in a two case yeah. in a skull. So I could keep going, but fight's a different thing. I was punching and going back and, and it was snarling and just slashing and slashing and snarling and everything. I'm, I'm just shreds now. My, my shirt is just absolutely shredded. It never got into an artery, but because of the violence of the fight, the blood had sprayed everywhere and it, I, I couldn't even really see what I was doing. I was just, I was just belting at what I thought was on the head, going back and uh, um, I was, my vision was obscured. And I, I was definitely getting dizzy and tired. I thought this is the last gasp effort now. And with both sort of fists, I heaved it, punched it, heaved it back out. So its rump was slightly up and its head was down in the kitchen sink. And I genuinely, genuinely thought this, it's 10 o'clock in the morning and I, I should not be having a scrap with a leopard in my kitchen sink. <laughs> it was a genuine thought that came to me and I pushed it out the window. Boom, and it plopped outside. I ran into my bathroom to stem the bleeding and to stop, stop it all because I needed to go and look for the child to see if everybody was safe. And um, finally Pretorius, now dead, two houses down. He'd heard all the noise and because everybody knew the leopard was in town, he heard the noise. He came around, fortunately, with his 12 ball and um, double tapped it. it. Yeah. Well, boom, boom. Fanny knew about cats too. Fine. <laughs> well, he'd been eaten by a lion. So he'd been down the same sort of road. John Atkinson said, now you might have to edit this. John, remember the size of Fanny's nose? Mm -hmm. It just had a life of its own and it started spreading. And John Atkinson once said, you know, you know what happened with Fanny? You know why Fanny survived that leopard, that lion attack? Because the lion took a big bite out of his nose and then it didn't need anything more to eat. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so Fanny, Fanny killed it. And, um, and that was it. You know, so Paul, thanks, so All right. Thanks, Thanks for your thanks time. Thanks for chatting. Great, thanks for great chatting. stories. And... <laughs> Yeah. I was never going to tell that.